welcome our next speaker, Jeff Stewart from Bankwest. Thanks. It's really good to sort of lead off from an infrastructure as code presentation. If you weren't here, you really missed out, but it um, really plays into my wheelhouse. So um, I'll move on. A bit about myself. Um, I'm Jeff Stewart. I spend most of my time at Bank West facilitating sort of technical change activities. Um, ops is relatively new to me um, and spent about 20% of my time writing code. In fact, having spent most of my career as a developer, I tend to look for excuses to write code these days, either at work or at home. I manage what we call the configuration automation team. Um, we're a small team of threes. Um, we don't really not like the name configuration automation, so we just tend to call ourselves the cats. Um, because we deal with technical change, we move around a lot, um, and over time we're sort of at the name Gypsy Cats. Um, so we're, we're Gypsy Cats at Bankwest, we have our own mailing group and everything. So, um, a bit about Bankwest. So we've been around since 1895. We were known as Bank of Western Australia. We're part of the Commonwealth of the Bank, Bank of Australia group. We have about 1.1 million customers, around 4,000 employees. Uh, being a digital bank, a thousand of those are in enterprise services, which mostly consists of IT. Um, we had the largest software development team in Western Australia. So today I thought I'd talk a bit about our OpenStack journey, um, and then get a little bit more technical and talk about how, what our OpenStack uh, stack look, looks like. Okay, so as a developer, way back when, um, there's plenty of situations where I wrote some code, I worked okay in test stage, and then failed in production. I also sort of upset my fair share of testers who sort of carefully meticulated test data, only, if, only for me to ruin it by plugging in what I was thinking about at the time. Um, also, you know, at the bank, we have really rigid but necessary change control um, for moving our applications between environments. Um, and it's basically what your average developer's pet hate at the bank. So um, back in about 2010, um, just had read Jess Humble's book on continuous delivery and was really keen on automating everything. And one of the things we started looking at was, you know, what could we do to um, automate the creation of our test environments? Um, so we call this repeatable test environments. Um, so it sort of seemed like a good idea. Basically, you know, um, if we used automation to build our environments and we could have identical environments all the way through to production. So we'd find out if we had an issue with an environment in test rather than in prod. Um, also, perhaps the developers might be a bit happy. Um, you know, they could either, if we messed up their data, revert back to a baseline or maybe even have their own environment. Um, and given that the environments were built using automation, then maybe we could start to relax some of the stringent change control we had about, about moving the applications between the environments. So this all seemed great, and we're all pretty pumped about this, but at the time, most of our applications were just a thin veneer over our mainframe. Obviously, there's limited options to virtualize the mainframe, so the benefits seemed sort of fairly limited at the time. So, a few years ago, my team sort of joined the infrastructure services um, division um, and became part of TechOps. Um, and first thing we did is take a look at how we manage our test environments. Um, and what we found is that given all the handoffs that we have in the organisation to stand up an environment, it took us about six weeks plus to actually stand up an environment in the bank. Um, we also did some analysis of all the machines that we had running in our test environments, and what we found is that on any given day, 70% of the machines in the environment had no network activity whatsoever. So this was a pretty massive amount of waste, we thought, um, and we used this as a means to sort of start kicking off some proof of concepts around IaaS. Um, so we sort of evaluated a few different things. Um, we started off with the existing tool set we had in the bank. Um, it was pretty old, um, and we struggled with that for a while. It had poorly documented APIs, and they were a bit dated as well. Um, and we gave up after about three weeks. Um, eventually, we got to OpenStack. We stood up an instance of RDO Pack Stack, um, and we managed to get a full stack up and running within three hours. So we're pretty sold at this stage. That was pretty amazing. Um, so, and the reason what helped us do this was the declarative template in OpenStack Heat. So leveraging all the resources already there available in Heat to put together a YAML file, 
um, which is nice and easily version controlled, which we could um, and we could actually declare the whole stack in just a simple YAML, YAML file. So we'll be solved, you know, great, we've got a full stack in code that we can version control. So we had to go for OpenStack. Um, we're really excited. We even got management approval to start pursuing it as a direction. But we got a lot of challenges too. Um, we're mostly a Windows and VMware shop, with, um, and there was questions around, you know, is this a too big a change for the organization? Um, our skills base, skills base in the tech ops area is mainly, um, you know, GUI point and click type skills. There's almost no coding or scripting skills, and definitely not much of awareness of infrastructure as code at all. Um, we, as again, we're mostly window, uh, mostly Windows shop, OpenStack's running on Linux. We did have a few really good Unix engineers, um, but did they have the bandwidth to actually deal with OpenStack? Um, and most of all, when we sort of showed OpenStack to the tech ops guys, rather than seeing sort of transparency and openness in the platform, they saw complexity, which scared them a fair bit. Um, so you know, we had a hard time pro proving benefits. As it turned out, even if we did eliminate that 70% waste, it didn't really equate to much in terms of dollars because tin is actually quite cheap these days. Um, and what we thought was the real benefit, which is, which is around consistent environments and the impact to speech to market for our application changes, we didn't really have any much stats on that, no sort of real metrics that we had collected over time to prove that case. So it was a bit of a um, you know, hard sell. But the, um, also our developers, um, been our key stakeholders in the platform. You know, we're pitching this at our strategic applications. .NET developers liked the look of Azure at the time. Um, Java developers liked the openness of OpenStack and really sort of um, were interested in that. But the thing that they all got and bought into was the idea of infrastructure as code and using code to, to define the environments and to get the consistency that we're looking for. But I think the thing that really got us over the line was sort of recognition of the bigger picture. Um, you know, cloud is where things are going. We really needed to start getting application ready to be, applications ready to be deployed on cloud. Um, we had OpenStack up and running already, um, so it was a bit of an easy decision to, to just run with OpenStack. So to start trying to build confidence in the platform, we decided to do a test and learn. Um, we chose our online application system as the first application that we put on OpenStack to run in production. Um, by the way, if you ever want to try out an application running on OpenStack, please go feel, feel free to fill out an application. Um, I'll talk to sales about a commission. Um, so um, getting ACS onto the platform was pretty straightforward. We only had to make a few minor changes to the application, and, and that was really just around how it managed session state. Um, and also we had to get um, or the logging off disk, so we use we change the application to run to log to a centralized login repository. Um, the project took a while; it ran over time, um, but it wasn't really about the application. It was more about just getting OpenStack to sort of integrate into our wider infrastructure, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. But at the test, end of the test and learn, um, we passed all of the su success criteria we sort of laid out at the beginning of the test and learn, and we got the go ahead to start moving more applications onto the platform. Okay, so, um, but we still sort of had a bit of a problem with developer buy-in at this stage, so what we decided to do was have a 15-day challenge. So we lined up 15 applications that we aimed to get onto the platform in 15 days. And the idea of this wasn't really about sort of demonstrating the agility of the platform, but more about looking at, you know, getting teams engaged. So on each day we sort of engaged a new team, and we got them to put together a heat template, um, and deploy their application onto the platform. And this went really well. The teams got really bought into the idea. They could see the agility. Um, and what's better is they could actually define their own heap templates and spin up their own environments in test. Um, and we got through all the apps in nine days, which was a really good story. OK, so now it's eight months since we've gone live with uh, OpenStack in production. Um, we've since done some value stream mapping exercises and proved the benefits of OpenStack in terms of consistent environments and speed to market. Developers prefer OpenStack and are excited by the, to use it. They, um, and all new applications are actually going onto the OpenStack platform. Um, we've had some, made some inroads into developing skills in the ops area. Um, we've still got a long way to go though. 
Um, and we'll continue to evaluate OpenStack in terms of the, its fit for the organisation and the um, and against other products. But so far, it's doing really well. Okay, so a bit about our stack. So we set some goals for our stack as we were, um, at the beginning. We wanted some guaranteed production-like environments throughout all our tests and staging as well. We wanted to get some no outage deployments going. Um, wanted to maintain our rapid feedback loop that the developers had. So basically, you know, when they check in code, they had smoke tests, tests running and completing within five minutes to give them rapid feedback to see whether they'd broken anything. Um, so we need, wanted to maintain that. Um, we wanted to give the developers a bit of room to innovate so that they could spin up some new technologies on OpenStack, try them out um, to help us get a bit of ahead of the curve in terms of tech change. Um, and we wanted to solve those density issues we talked about where we had the 70% waste on our tin. Okay, so we're using our RHEL OSP6, which is Juno, um, the Red Hat flavor, uh, running on KVM and RHEL 7 OS. Um, we have a separate OpenStack instance per data center, um, and they're load, load balanced by a highly available F5 um, pair. Um, so we have a three controller configuration to, for HA uh, on each data center. Um, and currently we're running two hosts, we're gonna plan, uh, scale that up to five hosts over the next, month, the next few months. Um, we're using NetApp for storage. Um, we're using the fast copy offload driver, which means that we get really fast cloning, um, which means that you know, we can really get the time it takes to spin up new machines uh, fairly quickly because it's almost an instantaneous clo clone of an image. Um, and we also, um, we haven't sort of uh, checked this yet, but we're expecting about a 90% saving in storage um, using the flex clone capability of the NetApp, which is great. Um, so this is what our stack look like, looks like. We've got our F5 load balancer in the middle. We've got two HA proxies, one on either side that he, um, with a VIP on them that the F5 distributes load to. And basically, um, the HA proxy is responsible for the auto scale group um, inside the cloud and the, we have an isolated network and all traffic sort of ex exits the network via a SNAT back to the wider Bankwest network. So there's a couple of problems with this. The scale down on HA um, out of the box on uh, OpenStack is pretty savage um, and doesn't allow us to drain load off the machines. Um, and the other problem is, is a HA proxy isn't actually av highly available on OSP6. Which, um, so if we lose a controller, we lose all the HA proxy instances on that controller and we can't recover. So um, we've got, we're just testing uh, version two of our, our you know, standard stack. So what we've done is we've written our own Elbaz driver for the F5, and that sort of works in an idempotent way, so it creates resources on the F5 idempotently so that it can work from either cloud. Um, and the last instance out destroys those resource resources on the load balancer. So it gives us, allows us to leverage the heat templates to destroy the, um, to create and destroy the load balancer resources. So HA proxy is gone and everything is still pretty much the same there. Um, oh, the other thing about, can I go back? Yeah, the other thing about that is um, it will allow us to do auto scale because we've been able to build in the drain into the F5 load balancer driver. Okay, so we're running mostly Windows workloads on the platform, which is a bit counterintuitive. Um, we are getting more and more Linux workloads as we, uh, as we develop um, new applications. Um, with they're all AD connected, we're logging to Logstash as our centralized logging repository, and we use chocolatey packages to deploy our applications onto the platform. So this is what our pipeline looks like. We're using Team City as our CI tool um, to do all of our builds. Um, and what we've added to it, uh, alongside our existing developer build pipeline is we've also got an image build pipeline down the bottom here. So we create a raw image, which is just enough to get it to run on the KVM hypervisor. Then we create a SOE image which has um, all of the common components um, and we create that using a flex clone so we don't incur much storage cost. Um, and then we flex, we're using the, what's called the frozen pizza approach where you sort of build as much of the image as you can um, and then just deploy the application on top. So we have an application platform image per um, application. So what happens then is um, at, with the change in either of those pipelines, we create a new heat template um, and we stamp all of the versions of all the components that go into that stack into the heat template, um, and that the heat template then goes into version control. Then Octopus Deploy, 
which is what we use for our deployment mechanism. Um, we sort of use this in a non-traditional way, I guess. Our octopus deploy is about having tentacles on all different machines. We have more of a monopus, so we only have one tentacle that pushes stuff into OpenStack. Um, so, and we use that to push heat templates into all the different environments. Um, so we get the same deployment mechanism in all environments using exactly the same heat, heat template in all environments. And we use the environment resource um, that goes with heat templates to provide the environment specific configuration. Okay, so what are the outcomes of all of this? We've got our guaranteed production-like environments. Um, so we've got complete stack automation and version control, um, which is really good. We're using the one template for all of our environments. We've got a mutable machine, so nobody gets onto a machine and tweaks it on OpenStack. We destroy it and repla replace it with a fresh one. Um, we've got no outage deployment, so basically what happens every time we do a deployment, we stand up a stack alongside the existing one. Um, we test it for a bit. In fact, um, for ACS, the team takes days to test their application in production before they make it live. Um, and we put a bit of fancy F5 orchestration to drain the load in a graceful way and reapply it to the, exist to the new stack. Um, we haven't done so well in rapid feedback. We've added about five to ten minutes to that feedback cycle, and mostly that's about standing up the Windows machines and the restarts required to, to join them to, the, to AD. Um, it's much faster with our Linux work workloads. But you know, the, the key thing about this is developers don't actually mind because um, they're getting feedback of other sorts a lot earlier. So you know, rather than getting these issues when they get into production or, um, or even when they're doing performance testing in the staging environment, um, they're getting that straight away. They, because they're production-like environments, they can run the st performance testing in the test environment, um, which means that we get a lot better feedback a lot earlier in the development cycle. Um, room to innovate. So basically, this is really well used by the developers. Um, we've got some bad behaviours. We've got some pets on the platform or manually configured um, machines. Um, so to combat this, we're just in the process of putting together what we're calling the Grim Reaper. So basically, what the Grim Reaper, will, well, what Death will do is send an email to uh, the owners of any machines that are, um, have had no network activity for more than three days. Um, and it'll be telling them that um, the Grim Reaper will be coming to claim their pets at midnight. <laughs> so, um, so basically what that means is they either have to go and finish their automation or take a snapshot of the machine so they, get, they can recover them later. So density, because we haven't got the auto scale, we've got full size production environments in test, um, which means we haven't done so great in terms of min minimising compute resources. Hopefully, with the version 2.0 and the auto scale, we should be able to um, downsize the environments in tests and basically but still be able to test them in, ter um, in terms of the auto scale as well. Um, obviously, the Grim Reaper should help with that as well. Um, you know, we've got test environments sitting around doing nothing for a period of time. Then again, it'll notify them that they're going to get killed and um, they need to do something about that. So coming up, um, we want to do a bit more to speed of, uh, uh, improve feedback time. So we're looking a bit at Windows isolation and sort of some unstructured PAS on OpenStack. So we're calling that PASify. Um, we are doing some heat template abstraction. So um, we use we build a lot of policy into our heat templates. So making sure that things like naming standards and things like that are adhered to. Um, the versioning, um, and we sort of expose those heat templates as resources or custom resources inside OpenStack. Um, versioning for that type of capability inside OpenStack isn't that great, so what we're planning to do is take that out of OpenStack and create, put a layer in front where we can actually do better, more fine-grained versioning of the heat templates. Um, and also do a little bit more about enforcing policy by actively examining the templates before they actually get instantiated. Um, and we're very interested in Docker and Kubernetes, so we'll be looking to spin up um, Kubernetes and Docker on OpenStack in the near future as well. Okay, so we put together a lot of bespoke code to get OpenStack to sort of work with our wider environment. We struggled a bit with cloud base and NIT. Um, we couldn't really figure out what was going underneath the covers and we had some issues, so we wrote our own cloud cat in it, um, which does most of what cloud base and NIT does on Windows. Um, but you know, we, at least we could understand what was going on. We managed to get it going a lot faster. Um, I've talked a bit about our F5 Elbaz driver. 
Um, we had to write some appenders for the applications to write to Logstash. Um, the ones out of the box didn't really deal with you know, Logstash going down very well. So we've written appenders that sort of log to disk um, if Logstash is down and then pick, pick out those logs and push them out to the um, Logstash instance if need be. Um, and there wasn't much great support for the software deployment, the Heat software deployment resource on Windows, so we wrote some support for that as well so we could get better um, eventing on our machine life cycles. So I'm telling you all this, I'm really proud to say that Bank has decided to start open sourcing its product. Um, and first thing that'll be going into GitHub uh, as the Bank's open source offering will be all of that code um, that we've put, put into OpenStack. So, <laughs> so hope you, hopefully that'll make life a little bit easier for you um, in your own open state journey. So that's it. That's all I have today. Thanks for listening. Um, feel free to ask some questions now, or otherwise you can just drop me an email. I'll be happy to help out any way I can. Any questions? Any questions for Jeff? Tough crowd. <laughs> Combination, so we've got things like um, Sonos Type Nexus running on there on Windows, um, and we've done tricky bits around attaching and reattaching storage so that we can still have CI with those types of workloads. Um, we're planning to put things like Confluence and Jira and Stash on there as well, mostly because those type of workloads change quite regularly and might seem to make it easier to keep up with the, those version changes by, um, by putting those in a CI pipeline as well. Um, so, yeah, we've got some third party stuff there as well. More questions for Jeff? Oh, yeah. Pretty good. Thanks for that. Yeah. We've got a question about the, um, is it the presentation layer, basically, for the apps and there is some database work on the So, um, we yet to do a lot of database. We did do a proof of concept with a database as a service. So, we created our own resource that basically created. Um, whereby we use a NetApp to clone databases um, and attach them to an existing database server instance, which, you know, so we're trying to get to this idea of being able to clone a database, run some tests, and then tear it down again. Um, but we're still yet to sort of face into um, issues around, you know, uh, backups and things like that. We do have um, some Elasticsearch instances running on the platform. Um, and we're sort of relying more on clustering um, to sort of provide high availability and resilience there. Um, but those workloads aren't backed up with the understanding that, you know, it's, you know, it's like log data or um, search acceleration type data, which, so we can sort of recover that um, fairly easily or can go without if, if, the, if the platform dies. Anyone else? Yep. With your kind of Microsoft background, have they been active in there? I know they're doing stuff in space. Are they trying to win you over? Or happy what's done? Um, no, so I haven't, we didn't, didn't really get a lot of attention from Microsoft. I think um, our focus on the declarative templating sort of ruled them out as like a, a forerunner. Um, obviously, um, Azure Stack will have de declarative templating, but it seems like that's a while away yet um, from maturity. So, yeah. Last question, maybe? Any more takers? Yeah. Can you talk about any um, challenges you might have had with security and um, how those conversations went? Yeah, so um, we spent a lot of time talking to security about this. Um, from their point of view, they were pretty excited by the idea. Um, so we, as part of all of this, we were able to build in to the standard SOE image um, HIDs. Um, we did a whole lot of pen testing before we went live, being a public facing system. Um, and we came through that with flying colors. So we did, we had actually no issues with the pen testing, which never happens in the bank. You know, the pen testers usually find something, in this case they didn't find a thing at all. So, um, and you know, moving forward, um, we're gonna start doing a bit more with um, firewall orchestration and things like that, which security are quite excited about because we get a much cleaner firewalls. Um, so yeah, this sort of quite bought into the idea of infrastructure as code and the, um, you know, basically the ability to build in policy 
to automation rather than having it manually crafted all the time. Cool. All right. Thank you. That was fantastic. Uh